I want to thank the organizers very much for the invitation. My very first visit to the Southern Hemisphere, Wednesday night, my very first time seeing the Southern Cross in the sky, Alpha Centauri. It is in so much science fiction, but I had never seen it before, and now I have. So thank you very much for the invitation to come and to speak. Uh, I am here to see us nearer to the microphone. Uh, my talk for this evening is entitled Activation Energy. Activation energy is a concept from the field of chemistry. The activation energy of a chemical reaction is the energy needed for two molecules to react when they collide. Many molecules would like to react, but cannot if they collide at low speed. For example, wood and air. They want to react, but you can hold a piece of wood in the air and nothing happens. It bounces against the oxygen that wants to eat it up harmlessly because it is the temperature of the air is below the activation energy. But if you introduce that same oxygen and wood to a high temperature, the reaction will ignite and you have fire. The only difference is how much energy is available for the collisions. But for some reactions, there is an alternative to simply providing high temperature. You can introduce a catalyst, an element or enzyme that lowers the activation energy. Once you add the catalyst, at room temperature, the reaction proceeds. I want to use that as an image to ask, what are the catalysts that lower the amount of energy you need to solve a problem with a computer program? I will talk about three things that for me act as catalysts that for me make it less effort to write a program to solve a problem. Tools, ecosystem, and community. I will start with the first one, tools. Always learn the details of how your tools work. I don't know if you have ever pair programmed or just sat and watched someone use a tool that you are quite good at and watched them try to use the editor, the uh, CAD drawing program that you know very well. But if you have ever watched someone uh, and waited for them to move the mouse and click, then you know that even in the tools you use, there are probably ways you could move faster if only you knew how. A very simple example, how many of you triple click? I discovered it by accident when I accidentally triple clicked one day. Uh, so you know that Command A, Control A selects a whole field. Single click and drag lets you be exact about exactly the characters you want to select. Well, a double click grabs a whole word, and if you double click and keep it held down, you can drag only getting whole words. You know, never get a half word by accident. Triple click gets the whole line, the whole paragraph, wherever the line feed finally is, uh, this is so useful on Stack Overflow. So often, you want the whole command line, nothing else, the one command line, you can often just triple click and you have it. 
I stumbled across it by accident and have used it ever since. Uh, another example that lowers for me the activation energy of automating a solution is uh, the editor I use, Emacs, has something, the Emacs macro. It remembers keystrokes as you type them and then lets you play those keystrokes back over and over again. You use control X open paren to say I am starting a macro, control X close paren ends it, and then control X E to execute it. I have a modest example here. I should paste this command into a terminal. How do I get the whole line? <laughs> triple click. Very good. I love triple click. <laughs> so I am going to get a little simple file. Let us say that I have discovered that this does not work very well as a list of tuples. Instead, it should be a dictionary. Easy enough to change the opening and the closing character, but in the middle, the syntax is all wrong for a dictionary. Well, I could edit every line by hand, but then you would have to sit and watch me, and I would have to sit and watch me, and that would be terrible. So, I am going to say control X open paren. Emacs is now listening and memorizing what I type. I'm going to go to the beginning of the word, back one character because I want to keep the quote, and backspace over the parenthesis. Um, the lines are not symmetrical. Some have two words, some have three. So I will search for the comma to make sure I jump over however many words there are until I get here, delete the comma, put a colon. Now I can jump to the end of the line. I want to keep the comma, but remove the paren. Now if I ended the macro here, it would be up to me every time to move to the next line before running it. So I will go to the line's end and go forward over the new line before I end the macro so it ends right where I want the next one to start. Control X, close paren. Ah, it's faster when I'm not narrating. Now, Control X, E, 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 E. And the task is done. I learned that when I was a young programmer and it often made it, if I could think of a repeated edit in a way that would apply equally to every line, it made many editing tasks very quick. Today, some editors do something similar with multiple cursors. Either way, try to learn one or the other technique because it will make you much faster at editing. Tasks of a hundred lines to edit that would otherwise be miserable become quick. Emacs macros let me automate what I would otherwise have to do by hand, like some kind of an animal. Here is another example. The Unix command line. Your uh, Mac, your Linux laptop, the Linux server, the Linux virtual machine, the Linux command line, Unix command line is famous for making it easy to select, sort, and tally text data. Let us say I want to ask a question about my laptop. Which services restart the most often? I am never more than 30 seconds away from an answer because of a technique I know where I use sort twice to get the answer. I am going to go to, um, I'll use this window I had open, I'm going to go to the directory of log files, and I'm going to run ls-ltr, long format, and I want the most recent files at the bottom. I always do this in log directories because so many of the files are old, and I don't need to see them anymore. But that would be too much to type. So I have created an alias called ltr, so that I don't have to fumble for the spacebar to do this very quick and important operation. Let us look at syslog.1 and ask, how am I going to figure out which services restart the most often? Ah, I don't know. That's a lot of data. If you search a little bit, 
if, for instance, I look at syslog1 and look for the word start, then I will see that systemd on this particular system is in charge of starting new um, services. So the first thing I want to do is take the lines that say systemd and ignore all the rest. So by running grep, I have reduced that very large number of lines to only the ones that are interesting. Now, systemd does other things besides starting things. It stops them, it restarts them. So I am going to ask for only the lines with the word started. Now it is only the lines showing the moments that services restarted. All I have to do is count them. How do I do that? First, I want to remove all of the junk from the beginning of the line, so I will get everything up to the word started using a regular expression and replace it with nothing so that the line now begins with the service's name. I then can sort the names to bring all the similar, all of the instances of a single name together so that I can count in one place how many times network manager restarted. The program unique, as it removes duplicates, can count how many times it sees each service name. And why did I call this a double sort? because I finally want to put them in order of which restarted the most often. So I run sort a second time, this time not alphabetical, but dash in for numeric. And it was the network manager script dispatcher service, whatever that is, that restarted the most often. With only a few basic tools, grep, to limit lines, said to remove the parts I don't like, and sort and unique, I am every day answering some question from a log file or a system at work or at home, and it only takes a few minutes to put together, a few, a few seconds to put together a data pipeline that I can use and dispose of and recreate the next day if I need to. Many problems uh, I tackle, I'm able to because this makes it so fast. It is a catalyst for certain investigations. Uh, and it is here in the slides, so you'll be able to study it later uh, when you see the slides on the internet. Unix commands and pipelines, for me, lower the activation energy, the effort, the trouble needed to automate text processing. Uh, for many people in the world, spreadsheets, are that mechanism. They were the reason people started to buy the IBM PC in the early uh, 1980s. For business, it is the most popular app ever. Why? Because it also offered an interactive relationship to answer questions with data that you don't have time to write a big program to analyze. Spreadsheet lets you get an answer quickly. Uh, other tools? Scripting languages. They were invented to lower the activation energy, the effort necessary to write a program. Things that you would never do in C++, it just wouldn't be worth the time to write the program, might be worth it if you have a very fast language. Uh, originally with Unix, there was a, it still is shipped, there was a little language called awk. It came before Python and it let you plug in to the text processing we just saw, but do things like tally up numbers or add the numbers in a column. Scripting languages have always been a way to quickly get answers. Python, of course, is my favorite language for quickly constructing solutions. The question of activation energy, then, is kind of the question, how annoying does a task have to be before you replace it with a script? Several times every month, I find that I'm unhappy. And I stop and I say, why? Well, it's because I'm doing something tedious again on the computer that I don't like doing. And I have to stop and say, why have I not written a script? Why at work or at home do I have a list of things to do for an install instead of having a script 
that just does the install for me? Often the answer is activation energy. Well, it would take 10 minutes to write the script. It only takes one minute to do it by hand every day. And for me, being a programmer who is happy and productive is finding the trade-off. When is it worth stopping? Not doing it for the 10th time, but writing the script that will do it from now on. It is a very personal question, and you have to explore when it is time for you to stop doing something by hand and make it automatic. It depends on whether also your tools make automation easy or hard. How can I lower, this is one thing I came up with for myself, how can I lower the activation energy of saving a command that I like for future use? Well, first, when it takes several minutes to research a command that I need to run, maybe on Stack Overflow, maybe I have to ask a coworker, I paste it into a file. I have a personal one and one for work. They are both called diary.txt. Sometimes I just put in the date and put in, ah, somebody just showed me this command. That way, I don't have to go ask them again when I have forgotten it. And it makes it very inexpensive. Flip to the editor, paste, and flip back makes it very inexpensive to have the computer help me remember that command line option that might seem memorable now, but a month from now, I will not remember. Diary.txt is for rare commands that I don't want to forget, but that I don't need to run very often because it takes a minute to search and find the command. What about commands that I run all the time? Well, what I have done is in my home directory, I, like many other people, have a, uh, a directory of commands. And in Linux, the traditional name for a directory of commands is bin. So I have a home bin path that I set up so that I can run commands from it. And I keep all of the scripts I write under version control. So they travel with me from one laptop to the next. I can go to my home directory, run git status, and see if any of the scripts, uh, if I have modified them and need to check them in. Uh, I, don't worry, I have a git ignore of asterisk so that I do not accidentally commit other files in my home directory. SSH keys, say, to version control. If your git ignore says ignore everything, asterisk, you're in no danger of a git add accidentally grabbing every file under your home directory. Um, when you do add something, you do dash F for force because it, it makes you say dash F if, if it matches the git ignore. So there's that extra bit of safety before you get something in your home directory and in my case, publish it on GitHub uh, because my home directory is there for everyone to get hints and ideas from if they are interested. Now it can be annoying for your home directory to always be under version control. Uh, your prompt, your shell prompt, where you have configured it to show the current branch name would always be lit up with the branch name, and you could commit by accident. If you bring up a terminal thinking you are in a project and accidentally commit some unprepared work in your home directory. So I have a command that renames a little shell script, checked into version control, that renames the git directory to something else because Git will not see it if it, if, it is, if it is not named .git. So most of the time, it acts like my home directory is not version controlled. When I am ready to commit a new script, I run the little command, .git is renamed to its normal name, and the home directory acts like it is version controlled again. So the last thing I wanted to really make this uh, like a really nice sports car is I wanted my scripts to, to the names to be completely different than the normal system commands. I did not want them to conflict. Uh, I decided to add a unique prefix. My commands would all begin with a character that no system command begins with, so I never have to be afraid I am using the name of a system command. So I looked at my English language keyboard. All right, I cannot use the lowercase letters. Those are used a lot in Unix commands. Well, what does that leave? There are numbers, 
There are uppercase letters. It turns out those are both used in Ubuntu in a few system command names. So no uppercase letters, no numbers. What character will I use at the beginning of all my commands? Well, I went through every one of these characters on the keyboard, and I experimented and read the Bashman page to find out which of them are special, because I cannot prefix my commands with a character that's special to the shell or file system. And it turns out it's almost all of them. <laughs> it left about seven commands left, uh, actually six characters left. Four of them I refused to use because I would have to hit shift in order to get the character, and the point is for this to be less work. One of them, dash, is the name of a shell built-in command. There was one character and one character only that was left. Thank goodness there was one left. That was a close one. The comma has no meaning to the shell, the file system, uh, it is a perfectly legitimate, though rarely used, component of a file name, and no commands already start with that character. So all of my custom scripts can tab complete, starting with comma. They are guaranteed to never conflict with system commands. I can type comma, tab. There is my full list of version-controlled scripts that I have written to make my life easier. And if I start typing one and hit tab, it very often completes on the first try because I'm sort of in a different namespace. I am not competing with all of the similarly named system commands that might start with the same letters. Comma tab shows them all. Some of my scripts are very simple. Some are complex, but all of them are designed to lower the activation energy of tackling some particular problem. For example, I have one that simply lists a file on the screen. It is called Compose Keys, and it lists all of, uh, there's a file on my system, which is all of the international keystrokes. Uh, on my system, uh, caps lock is useless. So I have remapped it to being the international key, for example, caps lock tilde in uh, lets me get to a character that is not on my keyboard. Uh, if I'll move that up a little bit for visibility, I can say comma C, uh, I can say, sorry, international key, comma C, uh, quote A, double quote A. I can get to all of these extra, oh, it's so great. If you're telling someone the temperature, international OO, gives you the real little uh, symbol. Oh, you can really show off in chat if you can do these uh, combinations. I always sometimes forget, or there is a new character I want to type and I do not know the combination. By compose keys, bringing up that uh, file, which I otherwise will never remember the path to, I can search and find how to type a Unicode character. Another thing I have scripted, how many of you have ever used Python-M? Python-M runs a Python module as a command. For example, many of them have as sort of little hidden Easter eggs, a uh, special feature they have if you run them from the command line. Simple HTTP server runs an HTTP server that serves files from the current directory. So if you're on a LAN and you have some files you want to share, you run this. Or if you have some static CSS and HTML in a directory, a static site you have generated and you want to test it, you run this. Well, there is a problem. I use this so often that I often have one running on one desktop, I switch projects and try to run it again on another desktop. What if you try to run two? Well, you get an error. It always tries to use the same address and gives you an error that that port is in use. So, I have a uh, script, comma, simple HTTP server that instead has a loop. It just starts trying 8002, 34, and it keeps trying until it finds a port. Now, I could then have it print out the port number, the URL that it has discovered it can use, but that would require work. 
And the point here is to avoid work, so it uses another standard library module, web browser, that will make uh, Internet Explorer or uh, Safari or Chrome, whatever is your default, open a URL. So all I have to do is run the script, and it both starts the web server and moves me into my browser where I am viewing the page without my having to do anything but hit enter. It instantly lets me browse a static directory. Another thing that annoyed me, sometimes I git clone one of my repositories, but I am not logged in to GitHub. Has this ever happened to anyone where you cut, oh good, not just me, where you have cut and pasted the URL, but because you are not logged in, it is the public HTTP, HTTPS URL. Everything is great. You can modify, you can commit, you can do all of your work. The moment you try to push, it asks for a username and a password and then tells you you cannot push because your SSH key does not work over HTTP. Only the SSH URL are you authenticated to push. I used to go into .git config and edit the URL by hand or log into GitHub and cut and paste again like some kind of animal. Instead, after doing that a hundred times, I finally stopped and I wrote a script. It looks at the current URL of the current Git repository, finds the repository name, the username, and rewrites it as an SSH URL. It's so fast, I get push, I get the error message. I run my script, I get push again, and it works. Something that annoyed me every week is now gone from my life. Finally, I will mention I have a script called watch. Uh, there's this command called inotify that without polling, it instead asks the operating system to wake it up whenever a file is edited. And so I always want to use this so that uh, over in a terminal window, my tests run automatically or my uh, slides regenerate or my document rebuilds as soon as I hit save. Because it's annoying to have to go over into the terminal and rerun the test command. Uh, the problem is I could never remember I notifies syntax, so I now have a watch command. I, at the end, say here, uh, look for all of the py files, py files in the current directory, when any, whenever any of them change, run this command. And it is a great way to rerun a build or a test every time I hit save without having to remember the syntax of the low-level I notify command. Finally, my master script. I have some scripts whose name is setup. What do they do on a laptop? They install all the tools I like to use, configure everything, and apply all of the little tweaks that otherwise I will forget, and only a month later when something breaks will I realize I forgot to set something up on the laptop. Instead of going into every new system I get or install and have to go through for days setting things up the way I like them, it all gets set up in a single script. I install Ubuntu in Git, clone the home directory, and then I run setup and sit back. When it is finally done, I log out and back in, and my desktop looks like normal. For many years, I did all the configuration by hand, and then I was just done. So I wrote a script. It is my own personal DevOps, where instead of sitting and installing everything by hand, you let the computer do it. So tools are very important, a good language, editor, and scripts to lower the activation energy of using our computer to solve problems. But what else do we need besides good tools? I will offer an example. I was looking at old Grand Canyon maps. Uh, on the old maps, this is how it was spelled. But the Canyon maps at the library website, Northern Arizona University, were listed by name. And that doesn't help me. I don't know where Emmett Wash is. I wanted to know where is each map on the globe. 
could I create, this was last Sunday, an overview map that would let me see where the maps are. Uh, I have created a little GitHub project that you can look at if you are interested in the code. I thought this way. Now, it actually wound up taking like five hours, but I thought this way. Can I get the HTML of that map list I showed you and turn it into names? Well, yes, that's easy. I use Python. I can easily go through the HTML and with very primitive string operations get the map names out and make a list. All right, where is each map on the globe? Well, that's easy. I use Python and I can access open government data. The United States policy is that taxpayers have already paid for the government geographic maps, taxes paid, the surveyor and geographer salaries. So taxpayers should not be charged a second time by having to pay for the map, so all of the maps are online for free. But I wanted the data, the coordinates. Uh, it took me like a half hour. I finally found they didn't have a big button for it. It was in a paragraph of text, the link that said, a database dump in CSV format. I finally found the link and clicked on it, and tens of megabytes of map data landed on my hard drive. Hey, CSV, Python knows how to speak CSV, so I was able to find the rows where the name and scale matched, and I had the latitude and longitude of every map in the list. Can I now? give those to JavaScript to display in the browser? That's easy. I use Python. Python has built in JSON that lets you get data and write it as syntactically valid uh, JavaScript to insert into a web page. All right, now I have JavaScript and some data. How do I make a map? Well, that's supposed to be easy, right? We have Google Maps. Well, if you do some work and read a lot of documentation and get it all hooked together, you get this. For those in the back, the text says, for development purposes only. So you can see that I have successfully drawn a box where each of those old Explorer maps is. But Google does not want to let me use this or show it to customers until I get an API key. Well, that is too much work. That is too high in activation energy, so I did not use Google Maps. I searched and found an open source library, Leaflet.js, and I found some free, they even serve them for free, map tiles from the OpenStreetMap project uh, by Stamen Design. Oh, Leaflet has such a nice API. JavaScript maps have come a long way from the last time I tried something like this. One line to create the map, one line to zoom it in to where you want, and then for each rectangle, one line to draw it. In one afternoon, I had and have put on my website for people who might also be interested in these historic maps, a clickable index that lets you zoom in and out and see the area of the Grand Canyon that each map covers. How did I take so many steps in one single afternoon? All of these transforms were only possible because of a low activation energy. I would not have tried this if it was a three-day project, but the fact that these tools made each step simple meant I was willing to try. So the tools helped, but also, our second thing, the ecosystem. The fact that the tools were not alone. Good languages are not enough. If all I had was Python and JS, I would never have built the map index. I would not in one Sunday have been able to make a zoomable, scrollable server of map tiles. The activation energy required would have been too high. But because other people with common problems have built tools that they give away as open source, there is an ecosystem now of tools 
that let you solve problems like maps that many people have very simply. And so I was able to accomplish something 10 years ago I could not have accomplished this way. So now, those are two of our three things, tools and ecosystems. What is the last ingredient? Well, to introduce this, I want to tell a story. Why was I looking at Grand Canyon maps? It is because a friend in the last year or two has gotten me into backpacking in the wilderness where you take food and water and go very far away from any roads or houses and get to be out in nature. When we were planning a Grand Canyon hike for next year, we needed to add up the number of miles we were going to walk because otherwise you die. <laughs> or, or, or they have to rescue you with a helicopter, it's very expensive. So, I mean for them, I don't know if they charge. And so I thought, ah, adding up miles as you walk, pretty simple. My friend is starting to learn Python. I thought this will be an example. I can show her how I use Python to solve problems. I will help my friend learn Python. And so I have started a little project with some sample code. Usually when I write Python, I use all of the features I know about. Here, I wanted to limit the features to just the ones that a beginning programmer would know. So the first input is trail mileages. If you start at a given trailhead, how many, sorry, miles? <laughs> National Park Service uses miles. The kilometers are in parentheses. The, um, so what are the number of miles between each waypoint and the next. That is one input. The other is our route. So we want to walk from the South Kaibab trailhead down to the tip-off, then before the sun sets, back up to the trailhead, how many miles? Simple question. I thought I could write a simple script and answer it. The output would be, for each waypoint reached, the total number of miles so far. As I wrote the script, I imagined explaining the code to a new programmer. First, how can we represent distances when they are not properties of waypoints, but of the paths between waypoints? For those of you who have studied computer science, how do we attach properties not to nodes, but edges? Because uh, the numbers are not attached to particular points, uh, one location, like the tip-off, might have many trails that cross there, each with their own distance to the next location. How do we represent that? This is a great question for a new programmer because data representation, how do we get Python to hold information, is a fundamental question in planning a program. You have a tuple, list, dict. What will the new programmer invent? to represent the edges, and there are many possibilities. Experienced programmers typically have a much smaller repertoire than new ones, because new programmers don't know the new rules. They will try anything. One thing that you could do is a simple list of tuples. Waypoint A, B, and the number of miles. Very, very simple. When you are ready to look for an edge on the hike, a simple loop. You go through all of the edges and look for the one that matches the two waypoints you are looking for. Oh, I know, many of you already saw the problem. What if you're going one way down the trail, but the edges in the database go the other way? Well, for instance, what if you're going uphill from Cedar Ridge to South Kaibab? A very beginning programmer might think, okay, I will handle both directions. Uh, in order to find the distance between waypoint one and two, I will look for an edge that goes either direction, since they are symmetrical. But maybe the student asks, oh, why two if statements? Can we only do one? You would have the chance to teach the concept of a canonical representation. We could make a rule. We always store the edge in alphabetical order. 
So the first one is wrong because Cedar Ridge should be first. If we establish a canonical order the way we always represent one of these edges, then we have a unique uh, pattern that we are looking for for each path on the trail. The, uh, all you have to do when given two waypoints is sort them to get them in the same order that they're going to be in in the data, and then you only need one if statement to find the match. But maybe the student will not want to loop to find every single edge. Searching a list takes time. The tutorial told me that a dictionary is faster. And of course, you can do the entire set of data the other way round using a dictionary, where you instantly look up the key of the first waypoint and then look in a second dictionary stored as the value to, uh, to find the second waypoint and its mileage. No loop is required instantly. Given any two waypoints, two key lookups instantly get you the miles, but at a cost. Each edge is stored twice. The fact that there is 1.4 miles between the tip-off and skeleton point has to both be stored under skeleton point and also under the tip-off. You have to store each edge now in both directions, which is a trade-off of using an adjacency list for storing a graph. Oh, by this point, I was pretty happy. I did not know I would be able to uh, mention so many fundamental concepts from such a simple example for our backpacking trip. This is such a nice illustration of data design. You are getting to ask the question flat in a list or nested with dictionaries inside of each other, which is the same as asking, do I want a relation, a table with columns, or do I want a hierarchy? Fundamental question in the history of storing data. Will my data be orthogonal, each edge is stored once? Or for efficiency, will it be redundant with each edge stored twice? Wow! All of the fundamental questions of data design are right here in this one example. Once the new programmer maybe has tried both ways, write the script with a flat list, write the script with the dictionaries, you can explain a relational database. What is a relational database? Is it a relation or a hierarchy? It does both. Create table creates the list of tuples where you put everything once. Create index automatically builds the redundant hierarchical data structures that provide fast access. So the official copy of your data is flat, but you are able to get to it quickly and efficiently through a nested data structure. Another very nice puzzle for the beginner as I wrote the script, to build the edges, you need to convert items into pairs because we give a list of waypoints, but A, B, C, D, but you now need to store the distance A, B, B, C, and C, D. To us, this seems simple but a beginning programmer has no idea. How will they do it? There are many possibilities. One, they might say, ooh, I know about indexing. If I use i and i plus one, I will always get out adjacent pairs of waypoints. They might also discover that they can carry state from one iteration to the next in a for loop by instead of simply having the variable waypoint that the for loop gives them, they can have a second variable of their own that remembers what the value was the last time through the list. Uh, a fundamental pattern we use every day, but that at some point, early point, we had to learn. However, the new programmer decides to do it. Having loaded the data and stored it, it was time to accomplish the goals. Print total miles hiked. I came up with a solution that involves four and a plus sign and print. I think my friend will be able to do it. How many miles? I then made it more complicated since water. Since the other thing you can do besides going too far is you can choose a path that has no water along it. That is very bad unless you know beforehand to fill your backpack with water. 
Uh, and I was able to adapt the main loop to do that by adding an if statement. If we reach water, set the counter back to zero. Now it is only a count of the distance since the last water. I got it working, the script worked, and I was ready to use it to plan a real backpacking trip. Problem. It was a UX disaster. Uh, UX user experience. I couldn't stand running my own script. It was so tedious. According to the rules I just laid out, I had to list every waypoint along every route. I couldn't just say, we will wake up in the morning at the South Kaibab Trailhead and hike to the Bright Angel Campground. Instead, I had to look on the map and list every single waypoint along the way. Well, that's clearly unacceptable because that takes time. So I set a bonus goal and I thought, oh, I will give my friend, she's learning an even better goal. Given a start and an end, find the path between the two waypoints. So that you give the program two waypoints and it finds the shortest path between them. I sat down to write the code and realized this was not going to be easy <laughs> to explain to my friend because this involves a theory from computer science. In fact, you need to use Dijkstra's algorithm. Well, that escalated quickly. I asked one question it was easy, another question it was easy. My third and final feature, whoops, you need theoretical computer science. Maybe programming is not as easy as I have always claimed. It was unlikely that my friend would invent Dijkstra's algorithm on her own while learning Python. What was I going to do? The second problem, I thought I knew Dijkstra's algorithm. <laughs> but when I tried, I wrote it wrong. Twice. <laughs> Dijkstra's algorithm takes a weighted uh, connected graph and finds from a given origin the shortest path to maybe all destinations or you can stop early when you find the destination that you are interested in. It begins something like this. Uh, we have a list which starts with only one element. How did I highlight that so fast? Triple click. It's great. You start with a list of the next places that you know how to visit and how far they are from the start. At each loop, you sort that list so you are always, of the new places you know how to visit, considering the shortest way to get there. You pull it off of the front of the list. Yes, computer scientists, I know this should not be a list that I'm running sort on, it should be a deck. I'll save that for her third week of Python programming. Right now, we are going to use a list and make it simple. Sort the list so that you bring the closest destination to the front. Pull it off of the list because it is now time to consider it. We go through all of the waypoints that are in our data set that you can get to immediately from the tip off or cedar point or wherever you are. And we now add them to the list of new places stating that their distance from the beginning is however long it took us to get here, plus the extra miles to travel that trail. And as you run through this, uh, all of the places in the graph will eventually arrive at the front of the list in order of how quickly you can get there. You are finished when you reach the end point. Um, now, one problem is that so we want to exit. We don't want to go on forever. So what you need to do, I knew you had to add a little if statement that when you finally, looking at the waypoints you can reach, ah, when you finally find the place you want to camp that evening, when you finally find the end, you are done and you can return. So I added this if statement. Problem, that's a mistake. I put the if in the wrong place. I put the if down 
where you have just found the first way that you happen across to get to the Bright Angel campground. But what if there is another path you have not found yet, which is shorter? You don't know that you have found the shortest path until something comes off of the list. It is this sort that, that, uh, that imposes the requirement that you visit things in order of how distant they are. So it is not inside of here that I know I have found the uh, closest way to get somewhere. Instead, put everything on the list and pay attention as things come off the list. It is as they emerge from this long list and come off the beginning that you know you have found the shortest way. So I had to pop the if statement out. All right, next you want to avoid backtracking to an earlier waypoint or you can get into loops because it doesn't know you don't want to go backwards. It will start figuring out that you can go from A to B, back to A to B, back to A, and will fill memory with all of these redundant paths. So, um, I, you, the, the standard pattern is that you make a set of the places that you have visited already. The beginning, it only has the starting node. Um, every time you are ready to consider a new node from the list, you say, oh, 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 wait, if I visited that already, let's skip it, because I've already considered that. And then all I had to do was add a line of code. Narrator, this isn't where you put the line of code. You have to add a line of code that, as we visit each place, puts it in the list, and once again, I put it in the wrong place. I put it down inside of the inner loop where we are seeing each destination for the first time, maybe multiple times. Maybe it's the third or the fourth way to the campground that is actually shorter. You are not supposed to stop considering a destination when you put it into the list. It is only as it comes out of the list as the shortest remaining possibility that you are ready to start ignoring it. So I made a mistake. It is not supposed to be down here, and I had to move it up. So a simple feature for my simple program involved a computer science theory algorithm that I myself could not write correctly. And even with all of my years of experience, involved me in several errors. Maybe this would not be a good first problem for my friend learning Python. I wrote it incorrectly twice. So I had wanted to tell my friend, Python, it makes problems easy. And I realized that maybe I could not claim that. Instead, if I show her Dijkstra's algorithm, she is going to think, programming is impossible and we have no hope. <laughs> what was missing? What was wrong with my plan to set up this little bitty problem of planning a backpacking trip and make it small and miniature and invite someone else to try it. Python, ecosystem, what is missing? The problem is that I was imagining my friend programming alone and trying to invent everything by herself. I wanted to advertise. Python is making things so easy that you could now solve everything on your own. But I did not learn Dijkstra by myself. I learned it in school from a community of programmers, of people who already knew how. What are the communities you are part of that you learn from? that help you know the boundary between easy problems and what are maybe difficult problems where you will need some help. Your school? University? 
Maybe you program in your workplace. Attend a local meetup. Go to a national conference. Maybe you chat on an online community. Or maybe you look things up on Stack Overflow. All of these things are various forms of the third and final thing, community. If you have a community that you are communicating with, you are helping them and they are helping you, they will help you know when you have run into a difficult problem and maybe should not try solving it alone in your room. Maybe you will cut and paste an example that already solves Dijkstra and knows how to find the shortest route. Maybe once you know this is a hard problem, you will go search and find the uh, Network X library. It is a Python library. It uses dictionaries, just like the adjacency list dictionaries you saw me make earlier, and has all of the graph theory algorithms already implemented. Earlier, when I needed to make boxes on a map, I knew to go look something up because I knew that was hard enough. I didn't want to do it. But someone wanting to find a path for backpacking, unless they have other programmers to talk to, they might not know that's a hard enough problem that you stop and you might go look for a third party library. You need a community to learn the often very sharp boundaries where problems transform from easy to hard, to learn the patterns of common programming problems to which we have already invented common programming solutions. Always be looking for catalysts. Always look for how to save effort to bring new problems into range of your time and skills that maybe you would not have been able to tackle if you did not have all of those tools. To lower the activation energy and make a problem worth tackling, you need tools, ecosystem, and community. And that is why I am so happy to see all of you here at PyCon Argentina. Thank you very much. <laughs>